We are fairly close to our agenda time at this point, and also uh, really happy to be bringing you uh, an interesting uh, group of individuals. These gentlemen that I'm hoping you can see uh, the slide on screen now are extremely involved in certainly open architecture, open standards. Uh, as you see to my left, uh, Mr. Joe Carter, uh, U.S. Army Program Executive Office Aviation Acting Systems Engineering Lead, but Joe is the FACE Steering Committee Chair. And I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but Mr. Carter, when it's your moment to uh, do an introduction, I believe you may have added another hat uh, to your job titles and workloads. So I won't say any more, uh, even though I probably told a little more than I should be at this point. Uh, next, we have Jason Derner, as you can see, uh, architecture team lead. Intel Technology and Architecture Branch, U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, C5ISR Center. Uh, Jason, I, I love it. It goes on and on. You are extremely involved, of course, in the um, technical working group uh, on the SOSA side. Uh, these gentlemen, uh, for the most part, folks, these gentlemen uh, are not just space or not just SOSA. There is a lot of overlap in their involvement on both uh, consortiums, so I'll let them get a little bit farther into that as, as you hear from them. Then we have Dr. Elia Lipkin, um, just thrilled with, with his efforts. As many of you know, he's our um, kind of our superstar. We look to Elia uh, to uh, get out there in the public. He does a tremendous amount of webinars and uh, connecting the public and going back and connecting uh, the government and DOD uh, for all the upcoming uh, new uh, technical standard from SOSA. So as you can see, a technical expert for the Air Force Life, Cy Life Cycle Management Center, Centers and Engineering Directorate, and he is the head of the SOSA Steering Committee as chair. We then have uh, my colleague that has been uh, just uh, an enormous help, Tyler Robinson, uh, elite engineer on our avionics architecture team, PMA 209. Uh, Tyler has been uh, a very um, involved engineer. We recently, we meaning NAVAIR PMA 209, launched our host, which is the Hardware Open Systems Technology website uh, to support that uh, particular platform. So again, four heavy hitters for you all. Uh, and to put the cherry on top, if I may, uh, Jerry Gipper is back with us uh, as uh, Executive Director, Vita Trade Association. Jerry, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Uh, this panel is yours. We'll let you, of course, uh, work through the introductions and then um, move on to our panel discussion and uh, open interaction. So it's over to you, Mr. Gipper. Okay, thank you, Sally. Um, great job on the introductions there for everybody. Welcome to this panel session and how do we keep moving forward? What's next? Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the slides. So, um, I'm going to need the ball for a second here. I'll bring up the slides. Can you have the host give me a screen share, please, Sally? Oh, there we go. Gary, the slides are already up. There we go. Oh, you're going to you're going to project them from there. They're already that. They're already there. You could just move them. Okay. Okay, we'll use those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, uh, Joe, I'll bring you up and uh, let you do, finish your introduction there, if you would, please. <laughs> well, Sally, you said, uh, you know, uh, added titles, and <laughs> that's probably true, but it's really the system engineering one is the one that I've added on uh, right now. I'm still doing the face stuff for the Army, uh, still enter, doing most of the, you know, involved with the MOSA stuff, involved with a lot of the open system architecture for aviation as a whole. Uh, plus, you know, I've been doing the real-time safety 
stuff for the uh, common operating environment that ASALT runs. So I'm not going to read all the chart to you, but uh, I've been at this job now. I always tease one of our guys because he said no one had ever lasted in my job more than three years. Well, I'm approaching seven, so I feel like that's been a huge success. You can go to the next slide. So one of the things that uh, when I first came in, I, I told uh, our guys, I said, we need a better way of messaging what we're attempting to do with an open system architecture. So we came up with this particular slide because every PM that you go to, and I really don't care which service you're in, I'll bet they all say the same, they have too many requirements and too few dollars. So what we did was we tried to come up with a, a chart that showed them by software reuse, what we could do and how their funding could actually go further. So platform A, and I just pulled some pictures. Uh, you'll even notice the last bird we don't even use anymore. But if the funding for platform A goes through B, and then we can reuse some of that software over in platform or the task B, and we can reuse that software over into platform B, now their money gets down to task C. If we extend that even further into platform C, it gets down to task D. So it gives them a lot of opportunities uh, to expand or, or make our stretch our money, make it go further. And you'll see at the top, the different reasons we would be upgrading Maybe new warfighter functionality that we want to use. It could be headquarter mandates by congressional or or higher from out of the building. Obsolescence issues or just technology insertions. You know, uh, obsolescence is a big one, especially with our enduring fleet because they've been around for such a long time. So. The other thing we're wanting to do is we want to make for sure that whatever we're doing from a face perspective, you know, helps reduce those costs through st strategic software reuse. Next. So these five principles, I, you know, I built a lot of this around MOSA as a whole because the five principles of MOSA to the side and then how the face approach and ecosystem meets those uh, to the to your right side of the screen. It's a, you know, establishing that, that environment, that, that's huge. Because if you're trying to do an open system architecture, you got to have that, right? We are in the process right now of standing up a MOSA transformation office. One of the things I've been tasked to do is stand up the digital engineering environment that we're going to integrate within our PEO network. Um, that's going to allow us to maintain models on the, on our systems. And we're going to have to try to provide access to those models uh, by external access. So external government agencies will will be able to use them. And FACE as a whole will, you know, supply that technical standard, the data architecture, uh, a lot of the tools, you know, the CTS, you know, rigs, BASA examples, BASA as a whole, has been a great training tool that we've utilized uh, within an aviation uh, portfolio, as well as it's been expanded throughout the, the FACE consortium as itself. The employee the modular design, that reference architecture and data architecture is going to help with that, uh, key interfaces. Those interfaces being the OSS, the IOS, S, and the TSS all coming from face, you know, will help uh, meet those interfaces. And then select interfaces, uh, open interface standards that we can leverage as part of the face thing is A-Rank 653, A-Rank 661, OpenGL, and POSIX. And then the thing that I always point out to everybody when they start talking about an open system architecture is certification conformance. And face, to my knowledge, is the only one that has that uh, capability through a conformance program that is completely operational. And we actually have a library that's uh, got a lot of products in it. And we're adding some, I think, just this week, we're adding some more. So next slide.
So I mentioned that we're undergoing a most of transformation. We're standing up that office uh, currently. Uh, we are looking across our portfolio and trying to see where areas are, you know, uh, where we could apply most implementation. Uh, we're following that guidance from DOD, the tri-services, uh, the AE and ASALT, um, not to mention OSD as a whole, uh, has been very interested in some of the things that we're doing and uh, have actually asked us to brief them on uh, the things that we're implementing currently. Um, I, most as a whole will be a source selection discriminator for future contracts. It, it's coming. And, you know, we're trying to look at the uh, language for contracts and everything now, and I push them toward the face uh, contracts language um, out of our business working group. So that's, that's one of the areas that we're pushing. Uh, as I mentioned, we're creating an environment across our aviation system uh, to allow this digital engineering, and it's it's expanding rapidly. And as and I have a traditionalist approach to a digital engineering environment. I don't believe in just from the system engineering side, but it's going to be from the financial side as well as the contracts and all the logistics. Uh, parts with facilities and things of that nature. So uh, our intent is to completely change the way we do network business right now. Um, we're looking at utilizing, you know, a complete digital engineering approach. Um, that environment as a whole is, you know, we're, we're in the process of training. Uh, I've actually been in a meeting today where I was talking about trying to get people you know, I need a schedule. I need a class schedule out. Um, we're we're putting that together. Hope to have that published. Just finished our uh, level two model-based system engineering class uh, two weeks ago. We start another one here in two more weeks, um, where we're trying to train personnel within PEO Aviation on model-based system engineering, uh, as well as just the design you know, or the, the concepts of open system architecture. So I think that's, uh, it, it, it will lead us to that reuse of software components. Um, there's other parts to this. I could talk for hours on it, uh, but I won't. I will not bore you. So I'll turn it back to you, Jerry. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Jason, I want you to spend a couple minutes here uh, giving us an update on what you're up to. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Uh, so, as, as mentioned before, uh, my name is Jason Derner. As the architecture team lead uh, at I2WD, I've been involved with both CMOS and, and SOSA since their inception. Uh, and as as I'm currently serving as the, the technical working group chair uh, within SOSA, I'm really uh, pushing hard to maintain alignment across those, those, those standards, those initiatives whenever possible. Um, so the, the slides I'm gonna go through, uh, General Collins already touched upon uh, many of the points. So uh, I'm gonna use this opportunity to just reinforce uh, some, of, some of the key points uh, from the discussions. So next slide, please. So I always like to start by just rebaselining folks with what CMOS is, uh, because CMOS is a suite of standards. Uh, a lot of folks gravitate to open BPX and the card aspect first, uh, rightfully so. It's, it's easy to understand and it does provide a lot of value, uh, but the fielding capabilities as cards is just one of the aspects of CMOS. Uh, CMOS also leverages the, the modular open RF architecture uh, to, uh, provide a, a, a decomposition for, for radios. Uh, it establishes the, the radio head construct, remoting the amplifier with the antenna. It really lays the foundation uh, to be able to share uh, the, the antennas, amplifiers, the RF uh, resources on the platform. Uh, in addition to that, uh, CMOS leverages uh, the vehicular integration for C4 ISR EW interoperability victory which establishes the, the network data bus on the platform and also allows for the discovering and sharing of services uh, such as position navigation time. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, and this uh, dovetails uh, into what, what uh, Joe was just saying, uh, from a software layer, uh, CMOS has adopted a number of frameworks uh, to really abstract the software from the hardware to get at uh, software portability and reuse. Uh, so in terms of the frameworks we've adopted, we've adopted uh, Red Hawk uh, software communications architecture, uh, from, from an RF perspective, uh, the future airborne capability environment uh, from a avionics and, and uh, just general purpose computing perspective. Uh, one thing to point out is we have adopted multiple frameworks, not because we wanna uh, proliferate multiple options, uh, but because each of those frameworks typically comes with an existing library of capabilities. So we wanna make sure we can reuse those capabilities and make sure that they can interoperate with the other layers uh, within the, the CMOS suite of standards. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this shows how it all comes together. As General Collins mentioned, uh, this is sometimes referred to as the universal A kit. Uh, so, so moving forward, ideally, uh, if, if a capability is software only, uh, it would be deployed as a software firmware update on existing hardware. Uh, so for example, if there's a, uh, a mission command or a C2 application, uh, that could be deployed to an existing single board computer in the chassis. Uh, if you do need to bring hardware. For example, there's a new communications waveform. Uh, you can feel that quickly as a, a card uh, and then uh, plug it into an existing or open payload slot in an existing chassis. Uh, ideally, that capability would then take advantage of the existing uh, antennas, amplifiers on the platform that are discovered and controlled via the more interface. Although if you do need to bring a new radio head, uh, perhaps because you're operating a different frequency band or you require a higher power, uh, you can simply do so, uh, bolt it onto an existing mount, but still take advantage of all the existing plumbing on the platform. So all that uh, really uh, gets at not only uh, cost savings in terms of integrating these capabilities on the platform, but also is, is what enables you to, to rapidly integrate uh, uh, new technology uh, when required. So next slide, please. So the since the, the focus of this uh, panel was what's next, I just wanted to uh, reiterate all of the ongoing activities uh, within, within C5 ISR Center, within with the Army, PEO C3T, PEO IAWS, in terms of uh, applying and using CMOS, right? Because from my perspective, that's, that's what's next, right? We have the standard, now we have to start incorporating it into, into acquisitions, into programs. Uh, so, so General Collins already touched upon the, 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 the strategy fairly well uh, in terms of uh, managing the standard, uh, including participating in standards bodies uh, such as the SOSA consortium uh, in order to continue to uh, evolve the standard, address emerging gaps, emerging requirements, but also continue to maintain that alignment that allows the, the reuse and economies of scale across the community. Uh, from the, the uh, establishing labs, uh, oil is in the forefront, and you'll hear more about that, I think, in the upcoming months. And then field experimentation, working hard to, to demonstrate CMOS capabilities uh, at upcoming events such as NetMod X and then Pintax. Uh, in terms of synchronization, uh, synchro we're synchronizing across uh, a number of programs of record, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll get into a little more on the next slide. Uh, synchronizing across emerging requirements, uh, which as General Collins mentioned, uh, CMOS mounted form factor is one of the big ones. Uh, and as well, uh, coordinating across prototyping efforts, either uh, within C5 ISR Center or coming out of organizations such as the network cross-functional team. Uh, so next slide, please. So in terms of ongoing efforts, so uh, PM uh, Electronic Warfare and Cyber, uh, released a, a memo previously uh, requiring all of their programs uh, to leverage CMOS uh, wherever appropriate. So as a result, there are a number of uh, program of records out of uh, EWNC that are already built against and aligned with CMOS. Uh, so the first out of the gate was uh, the multifunction electronic warfare air large program, uh, which provides an electronic attack, an ele electronic warfare support capability uh, for a Gray Eagle. Uh, Kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, you have the tactical cyber equipment CMOS chassis, uh, which is uh, using CMOS to, to provide a man pack capability uh, to deliver SEMA effects. 
Uh, and then in terms of uh, large ground vehicles, uh, you have the uh, terrestrial layer system, uh, which is uh, providing a, 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 a more capable integrated multifunction capability, uh, providing SIG and EW and uh, cyber enabling solutions. Uh, on the heels of that, uh, in the, the, the comms, uh, PNT and mission command areas, uh, as well as EW, you have the uh, CMFF uh, capabilities, uh, which will be uh, prototyped, uh, I believe, with the intent to uh, have a minimum viable product ready for fielding sometime in the uh, 25 timeframe. Uh, and then feeding into that a number of prototype efforts. Uh, so TSM uh, is uh, the, the comms capability that uh, came out of the network CFT TEM4 effort. Uh, as, as, as General Collins mentioned, uh, TEM5 is focusing on, on radio heads uh, that would be complementary to that card. Uh, from a S&T perspective, we're, we're excited to see the, uh, the, the universal software radio peripheral uh, getting ported uh, to a CMOS card uh, because that provides a, a very clear transition path as we prototype capabilities on USERPs in the lab, porting them to uh, a, a open VPX card and more ruggedized form factor uh, facilitating getting that capability into the field. Uh, crypto is a big one. Uh, we we uh, have always, uh, within CMOS, wanted to be able to share crypto capabilities on the platform. Uh, so, so one of the prototype capabilities to get at that, uh, we took uh, what had previously been done within C5 ISR Center uh, with the rescue program, a uh, government-owned uh, software-defined crypto, and we ported that to a mezzanine card uh, that can then be integrated on a switch in the chassis and thereby shared across all capabilities. Uh, in terms of software, uh, looking at porting all of the existing software that exists onto single board computers, uh, so, so Joint Battle Command Platform and, and the follow-on Mounted Mission Command uh, has already been ported. It'll be one of the capabilities uh, that we're looking to integrate as part of CMFF. Uh, What's not listed here, uh, we've also uh, worked with industry to port the electronic warfare planning and management tool to a single board computer. And ideally uh, in the future, we'll have both of those running on the same card in order to show the, the swap reduction that's uh, possible. Uh, number of uh, prototype systems uh, ranging from uh, last year, we, we demonstrated a, 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 a mounted assured PNT system uh, where in under six months, we took a chassis uh, uh, that had already been developed, a, a COTS PNT card, uh, integrated it on a striker uh, with a anti-jam antenna and took it out to, to Wismer to demonstrate a, a, a uh, rudimentary uh, assured PNT capability. Uh, similarly, uh, from a SIGINT perspective, uh, we, we took a uh, CMOS chassis. In this case, the chassis was actually developed by the Air Force as a SOSA prototype. Uh, but since we have aligned uh, CMOS and SOSA, we were able to reuse that hardware, uh, integrate it on a striker, and then rapidly uh, show the ability to implement a number of SIGIN capabilities within the architecture. Uh, and then on top of that, there are a number of ongoing uh, prototyping efforts and, and small business innovation research efforts to further get at the, uh, the next generation uh, comms cards, software defined radios, and then radio heads looking at both analog and digital uh, RF distribution. Uh, so with that, I, I think I, I've eaten up more than my allotted time. Just wanted to give folks, uh, again, a refresher on what CMOS is and then a feel for some of the ongoing activities uh, within the uh, C5 ISR community. Uh, Jerry, with that, back to you. Thanks, Jason. That was a good update. Um, Tyler, you're up next with uh, your update. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's Tyler Robinson. Um, and thanks for the introduction. So I'm supporting PMA 209. So you had the opportunity to hear from Captain Wilson earlier. So um, I, I just want to probably highlight a few of the lower level details that we are working in support of her efforts and um, hopefully be able to answer any questions that you have in those regards. So, uh, Jerry, can you go ahead and advance the slides? I don't think I have control. Thank you. Um, so, within our team in PMA 209, we have uh, three, I guess, sub teams, three major focus areas uh, the software 
team, a hardware team, and a platform integration modeling team highlighted here. Uh, so pretty much since the start of the FACE uh, standard, our team has been in existence supporting the open architecture efforts. Um, as the standards have matured, uh, FACE and, and now going into host and, and supporting other standards such as SOSA and, and OMS, um, our team has had the opportunity to, I would say, broaden some of our focus beyond just standards development into platform support. And so that's when uh, a few years ago we stood up this platform integration and modeling uh, team. And so with that team, um, we're really focused on working with those NAVAIR programs um, as they go to adopt the open architecture standards. Um, additionally, we've blended this with a modeling focus, recognizing the relationship uh, and partnership we can have with the um, MBSE community at NAVAIR. Um, and, and so we've developed that expertise within our team as well. So as we go to support these programs, um, we can kind of have that cohesive approach to open architecture and modeling um, within NAVAIR. All right, next slide. So here's just a, a brief highlight of some of the programs that our team supports. And um, we do have a small team, so uh, I don't mean to imply that, that we are intimately involved in the details of all these programs, but um, as, as SMEs within the OA community, we do have the opportunity to touch these platforms, work with them, um, at various phases. Uh, for some of them, it's, it's early on um, as they're kind of forming the programs and, and writing requirements and, and other programs. Um, it's, it's maybe uh, when they're going through some block upgrade and maybe looking for an open architecture opportunity or, or solution uh, with an upgrade. And, and so our team, um, we do have a focus on outreach to, to reach out to these other program offices. Um, we partner with the other groups within our office. As Captain Wilson had the opportunity to explain briefly, we do have a wide variety of products within PMA 209 that has the opportunity to touch um, most, if not all, I probably can't speak to the details, of the air platforms within NAVAIR. And, and so being situated within that program office, our team then has the opportunity to work with these products and to work with these platforms um, as they're going through their upgrades. Next slide. And this is, I think this is about the last slide I have as part of the intro. Um, again, just reiterating a couple of points. We do have a focus on MBSE. Um, we are not uh, leading the MBSC transformation within NAVAIR, but we do work closely with that group. Um, we are focusing, again, beyond just the development of standards. We still heavily support the new versions of FACE and the new iterations, but um, as that standard has matured, um, we've had the opportunity to branch out into uh, some other areas. And so our support, as I highlighted, it's not just the working with programs, but it's also what products can we provide? We still are in the business of providing, producing products to support these standards. And so um, we've moved, been able to move some resources and focus into things like tech starter kits, acquisition guides, and things like that. Um, so we, we help to, we hope to kind of build up a um, more robust uh, MOSA ecosystem is kind of one of the words we're applying to it where we have this supporting infrastructure through public websites, through starter kits, um, through guides. Uh, so, so whether you are a program office who's looking to put something on contract, whether you are a prime contractor um, who has this requirement, or, or whether you're a vendor um, who, who's producing some hardware or software component, we want to be able to support the adoption. And so that's really where our team is looking is, is, are there any gaps in this MOSA ecosystem? And if there are, what should we be doing to fill those gaps? And I think that's the last slide I have. So, so Jerry, um, back to you for now, and I'll be open to questions um, after the intros. Okay, Tyler, thank you. Um, next up is Dr. Lipkin. Um, Dr. Lipkin, if you could uh, jump on and do your introduction, we can get the, headed into that. Hi, can you guys uh, hear me? Yep, you're good. Great. So, um, 
Uh, I am the Air Force uh, Lifecycle Management Center uh, Open Architecture Support Lead uh, for OAMO. Uh, our office actually has uh, Open Mission Systems Technical Standard uh, run by Stephanie Atquid, and our chief engineer for that is Steve Brooks. Um, our goal primary is to support a deployment of open architectures for the Air Force um, and Air Force systems. Uh, next slide. So um, I like Dilbert, and um, I think this particular slide is interesting because everybody has an open standard, and we're always going to have another open standard come out uh, every year. So the question is, is how do we manage all these new open standards together? So one of the things we've done in SOSA is we decided to leverage other open standards first and adopt, adapt, and innovate only as required, which made us very unique and also set us in path of convergence with Army, Navy, Air Force, and other agencies. Uh, for example, Jason earlier mentioned Red Hawk. That's really an NSA product. Uh, we're using FACE, which is, you know, Army, Air, um, Air Force, Navy product. We're using Victory, which is an Army, Stanag, which is NATO, uh, it's, uh, so on and so forth. Um, SEA is another one which we're planning to use, which is uh, Wireless Innovation Forum and NATO Partners. Next slide. So um, there are a lot of benefits to doing open architecture in a consortium environment. Uh, a few of them are, it helps us uh, to simplify our requirements, our position, uh, help us a lot with sustainment and interoperability. Uh, the last two are quite important because once we standardize on the similar uh, interconnects or key open interfaces, as Joe Carter mentioned earlier, you can have uh, reuse of savings. It also makes uh, um, sustainment a lot easier because I can buy one part number for multiple programs. So instead of buying lifetime buy of, uh, let's say, 50 parts for just one program, I can do lifetime buy of 500 parts for 20 programs. So everybody benefits, and it allows us uh, flexibility and agility at a later date, which also speaks to interoperability uh, because it allows us to pivot quicker if a new technology comes out. For example, next year, um, Intel is going to be generating another processor. Well, how quickly can I field it? If program A pays for all the NRE uh, for uh, how we plug it in against SOSA, CMOS, and host technical standard, then we can probably roll it out within 12 months or less to all the um, compatible systems out there. And for the industry, uh, it gives you a bigger, bigger marketplace. Um, you can uh, improve on your development costs because one solution will fit multiple departments of the multiple DOD departments. It helps you create product families because you can service multiple variations for uh, unique customers. Your tailoring is uh, simplified and strategic sourcing. One of our challenges is uh, a lot of times in OpenVPX before CMOS, Host, and SOSA, uh, whatever you buy, you're stuck with that one vendor for life. Uh, with SOSA, whenever you buy, you have a choice of multiple vendors for life. So uh, your ability to pivot quickly if something happens to vendor A um, is greatly improved. So uh, one of the things we've done is we followed the face uh, uh, model uh, to make sure that everybody has skin in the game. If we pay 100% of everything, uh, what's the risk to you, the company, for success or failure of the technical standard? It's very minimal. It's all on the government. The skin in the game, the risk is shared. So it makes us more um, interesting and challenging as well. It, it, it helps us to open up the aperture for SOSA participation. Uh, we have over 100 companies join the SOSA consortium. If uh, it would have been the other way, we would have been more selective on who we invite. Uh, the way we mature the technical standard is through a series of prototypes to validate and verify that the SOSA technical standard is properly designed. So as we iterate through uh, development test demonstration, we feed all the lessons learned and things we discover right back into SOSA technical standard so other folks get an opportunity not to uh, make the same mistake. It also makes for more robust open standard because we're constantly validating it. Next slide. Uh, I borrowed this from uh, Jason's Derner team. They did a good job. This is a copy of a tri-service memo uh, which outlined uh, uh, SOSA, 
all mass face and victory is the four uh, major standards to look at and of course PM, EW, C, uh, memo as well. Next slide. So this is the newest addition to source endorsements. Um, I actually pasted the whole thing over. Uh, if you uh, want to read the whole thing, it's in the Congressional Report 116442. Uh, the link is pasted on the lower right corner. And uh, I will read you one paragraph. Uh, finally, the committee believes the military services should begin to combine missions to enable Seamless and SOSA for multi-mission tactical communications, electronic warfare, SIGINT, and battlefield computing in one system. Such an effort will reduce swap uh, on various platforms for the military electronics and unify the industry around common military hardware as well as software standards. So this is one awesome endorsement from uh, Congress. Um, this is, uh, again, part of uh, NDIA, uh, the Thornberry Act, and uh, it's very powerful. Basically, what Congress is saying is what we're doing is the right thing, and we're in the right path. It's the best endorsement I can ask for. It also reinforces the need for standardization across services. Next slide. Um, there's more than 100 members. Uh, again, I borrowed this slide from the Army brief. A lot of times people ask, what's the relationship of SOSA to CMOS? And it's captured here as well as um, the list of participants. One of the major additions to our group right now is Intel. Um, as you can see, the corporation. So we're working with them to see how we can streamline um, adoption of Intel products, um, processors, FPGAs, Internet of Things. Uh, we're also in discussions with NVIDIA as well, uh, currently. Mellanox, which recently got bought up by NVIDIA, is a member of SOSA Consortium, so we've been uh, discussing with them as well. Next slide. Uh, this is a commercial roadmap that we put together to help uh, government and industry to plan uh, procurement and tech refresh. Uh, one of our challenges is a lot of times I get a SOW or a document or proposal from the industry and I have to evaluate for its technical qualities. And one of them is, are you selling me an obsolete component, or is that component going to go obsolete when I field it? So what we did is we worked with the SOSA Consortium uh, Hardware Working Group to come up with a roadmap of technology. Uh, where do we think it's uh, starting? Where do we think it's sunsetting? And uh, where are the upgrades are? And it's very powerful because using this small diagram, if I get your proposal, I can say, aha, uh -huh, you selected PCIe Gen 3. Well, guess what? In CY22, it's being sunset in favor of PCIe Gen 4. So why should I buy a technology from you that I know is going obsolete? Uh, or it can also encourage me to invest in PCIe Gen 4 over PCIe Gen 3 because that's what the mainline cuts components will be going forward. It basically allows me to figure out where the knee in technological curve is uh, very easily for the programs. Next slide. So we're having a virtual plug fest uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Air Force is gonna try something new. Uh, we are inviting uh, vendors to uh, deliver their components. A lot of them already arrived at, uh, today, actually. And we're gonna do it uh, in about two and a half weeks where we're gonna test out and see how many cards, components, and capabilities we can uh, swap in, swap out. And the lessons learned and additional information will be shared. If you have any questions, contact information is right there. Next slide. Finally, we have several outreach activities. Uh, we have quarterly newsletters, we have a website, we have multiple events, uh, today is one of them. And if you have any questions, there's uh, emails and contact information there as well. Next slide. And uh, I think I'm done. That's it for you guys, yeah, thank you. Um, there's been a lot of questions uh, come in, so I'd like to kind of open it up to the panel discussion with we can, well, Bring up questions and uh, maybe I'll call on one of you to start the question and then if others have some things you uh, want to add into it, um, that would be great. Um, I'm going to start with one of the questions that I had and that is I heard uh, several of you talk about um, the uh, need for model based systems engineering. Um, how does do organizations like somebody like Vita, what do we sh should we be doing different to make it easier for you guys? Um, Joe, you maybe I can start with you. To be honest, I, I don't think there's anything that you really could do. I, I think you are pretty much right in line with things that we're already doing and already utilizing. So, there's no no tools or anything like that, or standards written in a different format, or 
Oh, I'm always looking for other tools that we could <laughs> utilize. So have you got an hour? Yeah. Jason, you talked about it. Do you have any comments? Did I lose Jason? Sorry, I forgot I had to unmute. <laughs> One of the challenges of being virtual. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the comment of the year, right? <laughs> it still amazes me that we have systems that have two or three layers of muting, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so the question was regarding model-based system engineering. Yeah, is there anything the standards groups should be doing to maybe make it easier for you guys with the work you're doing? Not from a, a model based system engineering perspective, right? I mean, the uh, from and, 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 and I mean, I'm, I'm going to go off topic for a second, but I mean, it, from from my perspective, right? We we've we've got a lot of the standards written right now. We we need to start using them, right? And 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 using them, I think we're going to learn a lot, and uh, I, I think the Understanding, and this is where I guess model-based system, system engineering could help in terms of understanding uh, as we as we've broken down our stovepipes, right, and we move to multifunction. How do all these missions that that typically operated independently, how do they start to to work together to provide a, a cohesive capability? And and what are the implications in terms of shared resources, uh, user interfaces? Uh, so. Not, not exactly answering your question directly, but uh, I could see MBSE kind of factoring into some of that. Right. No. Okay. Hey, Jerry. This yes. This is Tyler. I, I can also uh, dance around that question. I think uh, <laughs> um, w I don't I don't have a direct request of something the standards bodies could do differently, but I, I would highlight that um, I would say in years past within NavAir there has been more thrust on maybe a higher level of modeling. That, that mission level and that system black box. But now, over the past uh, maybe year or, or more, there's been more focus on what I would say is a lower level modeling, getting down inside the subsystems to the components and looking at how we could use modeling to, to better support you know, those desires at, that might get down to a host level. So we are looking at modeling the host standard. We are looking at how we would model cards and pens and these types of things and into what level would be appropriate to provide benefit to the government and and so i think um as of today there's not a specific request but it is something that we are um continuing to push forward more with even at the lower levels okay dr luck can you have anything to add to that or no not really um i think all these answers were good okay we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to get through as many of them as I can. Um, how do the open systems architectures that we've been you've been talking about today um, scale across the different platforms operating in different domains like Airland and Maritime? Um, does anybody want to take a stab at that? Okay, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, so they they scale very well, right? So our our motto from day one has been architecture is independent of altitude right there's there's nothing about any of the technologies that we've selected that bind them to a ground vehicle and an air a manned airframe a, a pod a ship a sub right that they are all equally applicable and, and i think you you're, you're seeing that ba uh, uh based on the fact that you've you're you're starting to share hardware across both air and ground programs, right? And, and I think that will continue to, to grow as more and more programs start to embrace and include these standards. So I, I guess I just want to foot stomp. I mean, the, we, we have a lot of diagrams and I, I know I've taken heat from it in terms of I show a, a, a slide with a, a ground vehicle on it. And then my first question is, well, why isn't there an airframe or why isn't there a pod? And the answer is I was too lazy to create N versions of the same slide, right? It's <laughs> they are all equally applicable over. We need a we need a cloud image for the uh the different uh different uh environments, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Roger that. So um anybody else? 
So to, to actually piggyback on what Jason said, uh, we build a standard not to be just altitude agnostic, but also uh, domain agnostic. For example, uh, Jason forgot about submarines. <laughs> so, you know, undersea, uh, what do you call that? So uh, the point is, and uh, this is something that Mr. Tramper from OSD uh, stated during the last SOSA um, face-to-face event, is we're working toward Converge RF. Physics are the same. The use cases between Army and Air Force, how we deploy it, are different. So when you boil down to the pure technology levels, it doesn't really make a difference. So once we realize that it's really the same, it was a lot easier to develop, develop commonalities. However, my interests are aircraft, his is ground vehicles. But that's okay, because uh, the vendor is still going to sell me one SDR. They don't really care where I plug it in. Mine may have conformal coding, uh, Jason's won't. But it's still going to be the same card. Um, Joe, I'm a, uh, this question's for you. Um, has there been any concern from the program managers regarding software areas that they feel are not covered by the FACE technical standard? Um, and if so, what are they looking to bridge the gap? Uh, for the most part, I think they've pretty much been happy with everything they've done. Um, I, I think the standards are pretty broad, uh, The you know, whichever face standard you want to use. I think they're pretty broad. I always push them toward using 3X. Notice I didn't say 3.0 or 3.1. I just say 3X. <laughs> uh, I, I don't care which one they use. Uh, for, I have heard of no issues from any of our platforms, and I'm pretty good about asking asking those questions. Well, how how did new uh, requirements maybe get passed into what you're doing? Normally, they you know if one of the platforms or the, one of the PMs is having an issue, they'll they'll come back to me knowing I'm the centerpiece for the face stuff, right? So what I do is I send it back up through the technical working group. Uh, I, I'm sort of blessed in that the chair of the technical working group, Chris Crook, works for me. So uh, we we can have a conversation in my office, assuming we ever get back in our office. But, uh, you know, I, I have them push it back and have them look at the uh, standard as a whole and see if there's anything we need to do. Or they can submit a PRCR process back uh, to the consortium for, for check. Does anybody else have anything in that area? Mostly. Um, another area question I have is, um, this kind of goes back to Dr. Lipkin's uh, Dilbert cartoon, is um, it seems like the number of standards uh, is growing. And so how do you guys, how do you handle that? I mean, Dr. Lipkin kind of talked about it, but um, New stuff keeps getting added. Are you concerned about that, or what's 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 what? What other philosophies do you have? Quite simple. We have groups designed to work with the new standards as emerging for alignment and harmonization purposes. We have a way to stand it up as required. Uh, most recent example is SCA and White House Innovation Forum. Um, that is how we're planning to do this: outreach and collaboration, and uh, seeing opportunities to leverage each other. So I think you got to look at it from, you know, you got to address the different domains, uh, software, hardware, signal processing, network. You know, so if if we pulled that thread a little bit and you just use an example of system architecture, for software, we would use FACE. And, and I know for a fact that SOSA and CMOS both leverage FACE for some of its software. For hardware, we, we use HOST. For signal processing, we're using MOSA. For our networking stuff, uh, I push victory. Uh, the main topics that I always push are face, host, uh, SOSA, and victory. Uh, I tell them, you know, that's not inclusive. There may be others that we need. I mentioned Mora, Moa, Mora, and I think that's, uh, you know, you just got to look at the domains for what you're doing. How, how do you guys yeah, that... Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add one other thing. So the, even though it might seem like there's more and more standards, uh, I, I think we maybe haven't done ourselves a service because 
all of the, or at least all the standards that, that we've discussed today are aligned, right? They, they might have a different name in the Air Force, the, the Navy, the Army, but they, they've all been aligned. They're all leveraging the same commercial standards, right? I mean, so I, I truly am seeing more of a convergence as opposed to a divergence in terms of the number of standards and how they all play together. Over. At the same time, how do you um, how do you work with other groups that may be working on open standards architectures? Um, I know you guys have done a really good job within the uh, the U.S. DoD. Is there other organizations? Um, I think um, Tyler, you meant you touched on some of them a little bit in your your slide set. But how do they get involved? Certain certainly, there's um, there's a few other organizations that come to mind um, that aren't. Uh, just DOD specific. Uh, I mean, one that comes to mind, we work in certain areas with the OMG, for example, the Open Management Object Management Group, um, as we start to touch some standards uh, that would impact uh, the, like the UAF profile and things like that. So where there is a need, we will have members of our teams um, absolutely interface with those to create the the right touch points. Um, I, I know there was a question asked about COSA. Um, COSA, Collaborative Open Systems, is a working group we've established with the UK Ministry of Defense. And so we have the UK, the Army, and Nav Air participating in that uh, to look for areas of alignment and divergence within standards. So um, really, we, we I, I wouldn't say I have an answer as far as an overarching approach to address every single um, other body that's out there, but certainly we have SMEs in the field that start to recognize where there is um, potential alignment or divergence between standards and, and we get the right experts plugged in and, and become active in those groups. Um, I want to grab a question that came in off the uh, off the WebEx here is, is there any work that's being done on a common standard for ELINT signals and data? Is anybody aware? Honestly, that's a loaded question. I can't even answer in this forum. <laughs> uh, long story short, uh, we're exploring. That's all I can really say. Okay. Um, the other set of questions that I have been monitoring and trying to quickly answer by text is model-based system engineering and cyber. Uh, we do have a lot of activities in SOSA to support model-based engineering. We're leveraging phase data model uh, for one as part of SOSA activities. Another is we have an entire team uh, out of Huntsville, uh, uh, JSIL, supporting SOSA MBSC activities where we're actually literally modeling the SOSA technical standard in uh, SysML UML, with the goal of outputting uh, all of the shells uh, right out of the model rather than the document. So if things go well, the SOSA document will be an uh, auto-generated product right out of the SysML UML models. Right now, they're leveraging Enterprise Architect as their goal. Uh, primarily due to the cost of enterprise architect. It's uh, very affordable for small businesses in academia. Uh, so hopefully that will answer a whole bunch of questions on MBSC. If you guys are interested in seeing what it is, uh, right now the MBSC model is Distribution D, it hosted on Air Force VDL site. If you have the credentials, you're more than welcome to download it and explore it. And yes. If you have questions about the data modeling, uh, FACE technical team can help or SOSA technical team on data modeling can help as well. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of questions on the, uh, the MBSE stuff, so we'll have to respond to some of those uh, offline here. Um, the space domain seems neglect seems neglected here. Can anyone care to speak about uh, what might be happening in that area? Yes, uh, the space command joined SOSA back in December, and uh, they had an initial kickoff the last virtual face to face. And uh, right now, we're ramping up to support space community. Uh, I can't say any more than that till the space community is ready to say it themselves. But uh, what we've done is uh, leveraging um, some of the lessons learned from SUMO, if you guys know about that space technical standard, and uh, space VPX are all being rolled into SOSA to support uh, leveraging the common interoperability environment for the satellites as well as the air, ground, and submarines. So the best thing I can say is they have to join the working groups and participate to learn more. So, a question I have too is, um, what 
what about the modular open systems uh, keeps you guys awake at night? Or, or all these having the infrastructure. Or, or are you the all sleeping well? In place? <laughs> what was that? No, again, I don't Joe? sleep at all. <laughs> I said I don't sleep at all, but uh, I, having the infrastructure in place so uh, we can provide access to everybody, and uh, it, it ranges all the way down to making sure we got the proper number of licenses for modeling tools and and uh, access. Uh, that we're going to give to our models as a as a whole. Do you, do you feel like you're getting the support you need, or is it a constant battle for you to get the support? No, we're we're definitely getting our support. Uh, I mean, it's it's going all the way up to General Barry. Uh, he, he's given us uh, complete rights. My boss says he told me just last Friday. He said, "Run it the way you need. If you need to hire more people." go hire them and uh, I, I knew with my operating budget uh, where I could pull certain people and matter of fact I pulled that trigger yesterday and started uh, putting out uh, hiring notices. Uh, Jason you have any comments on that area? What keeps you up? So I guess what what keeps me up the most is trying to decide what, what the right level of specificity is within the, the, the technical standard, within the architecture, right? What the right decomposition is, because it's, it really is a balancing act between specifying enough so that we get the, the, the reuse and portability. And what, what people mean by reuse and portability is is relative, right? Is it is it within a PM? Is it within a PEO? Is it across services? Ideally, it would be all of the above, right? That we would be able to leverage capabilities across the board. Uh, but but in order to do that, I mean, we need to have uh, specificity to guarantee interoperability. And at at that point, you're you're also the more specific you get, the more you potentially constrain, right? So making sure you don't constrain too much so that uh, you're impacting performance or you're stifling innovation. So that's, I think that's a, that's a fine line. We we constantly walk and then we're gonna constantly probably go back over the, the line and, and make the trades to, to figure out what's right for the community. Over. Tyler? Um, what's uh, keeping you up? I can, well, I'll, I'll uh, answer it this way. I can I can definitely say there's one thing that used to keep me up, <laughs> but I think it's changing now. And I think especially maybe five years ago or so, I, I I think as we were growing some standards and trying to get adoption, there was always the question from a program as to, well, how much is this going to cost and how much is it going to slow me down up front? Um, and I don't think, at least from my perspective, I, I think I – we have to understand where I am as an engineer within a team. I'm not senior leadership myself, but um, we had to weigh those and kind of establish the value ourselves. Um, within the past few years, I've seen even greater push from leadership from above. And, um, and I think that's doing nothing but ease the adoption. Um, from, so the momentum now is stronger than ever. And um, I think less and less now we're having to um, fight those fights within the programs. And I think people are starting to see the value in, in considering open architecture approaches from the start. So I think that was the issue five years ago was can we justify an open architecture approach? Dr. Lipkin, other than tornadoes. <laughs> no, um, uh, just access. So there's a lot of open standards uh, that are behind the silos of excellence uh, that we have to compete with. And what's keeping me up at night is uh, what's going on behind the silo of excellence Z that hasn't opened up the door and says, we spend a billion dollars or $10 billion, use us. Well, I don't know if I can, if I don't know what your requirements are, if you are supporting all the programs and all the missions. So what's keeping me up at night is not knowing what's behind the uh, Silos of Excellence door X, and how will it impact what we're doing today? I would say that's the biggest challenge. Have you guys seen any um, um, 
it's been mentioned that, that you know part of this whole strategy is the cost savings and being able to reuse stuff for other programs and stuff. And I know it's it takes a long time to see some of that stuff, but are you starting to see signs of that? What I am starting to see is, I'll give you an actual example. Uh, one of the vendors failed to deliver us um, an LRU in the time required. Uh, we had a, an, a test event that we needed to do, and we had no box to put our capabilities in. So I picked up the phone, and within, I would say, seven hours, I had two alternative boxes available from multiple vendors. So then we just picked the alternative, and uh, it was shipped. And within five days, we were operating on somebody else's box. Um, and what this happened is it demonstrated our ability to pivot quickly to uh, deal with the contractor non-performance issues. Okay, um, I'm going to start wrapping up here. I got one more. One more. Does anybody else want to add to that? By the way, but on the cost, we well, I just wanted to, to to echo what. Uh, Dr. Lipkin said in terms of we had a similar experience, a program, a, a card was delivered late and uh, due to having multiple suppliers for that same card, we were able to, to pick up a competitor's card and then still meet schedule. So that's uh, that probably cost, uh, translates into a cost savings, right? It, it's not having to delay the program, uh, but I think that's just one example of the the benefits we'll realize moving forward. Over. So one thing I do want to point out, and um, I just feel it a question. Cost is important, but it's not number one requirement. Number one requirement is fast fielding, fast upgrades, and fast capabilities to the warfighter. If uh, two cards that are identical, um, you know, given to us, obviously the cost will be the last decision factor to use. But the num number one priority for us, it's not the cost, it's fast fielding. Just want to make sure we're clear. We're using open standards to support fast fielding, fast upgrades, fast deliveries. That's a good point. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with one, one last question. We've had quite a few uh, or a handful of questions come in on um, international access to the work you guys are doing. Um, any update on what's going on there that we can share with the audience? I mean, a lot of this is uh, US DOD focused. So I'll take so, it from the face perspective. It's uh, when I took over in the chair a couple of years ago, I opened it up and I told them to start acting like we had internationals. At the same time, my predecessor went to the State Department to try to get approval to remove uh, some of the ITAR stuff off of our documentation. So we're still in the process. We're still working, uh, trying to get it open. Uh, I never thought it would be difficult to take it off, but it's just a statement. There's no ITAR in ours um, particular standard, and it makes it, it's been a unique challenge to uh, remove that ITAR from, from our documentation. But our intent is to go international and open it up where we can get international participation. Anybody else? The the host standard is uh, distro A. It is publicly released. So so this is as well distro A publicly released, but we do have appendixes that are distro D and above if needed. So the goal is to allow international bodies to leverage our standard. Uh, however, participation in the working groups is restricted uh, because of the nature of the business. Uh, however, with that said, we do welcome if somebody wants to pick up from our uh, industry partners overseas, so the technical standard snapshot three or upcoming version one, and provide us feedback in the written form. We're always glad and happy to receive inputs that way. Um, the results you will see in the next revision of our technical standard, because it has to be PO approved uh, to be released as a distro A, but we're always welcome input in writing or anything that we publish on the open group site for everybody's consumption. It's not an easy way to work, but uh, it's the uh, safest way to work. Any other comments? Yeah, so I, I would echo everything that was said. I mean, from, from a CMOS perspective, we, we push to make everything publicly releasable or publicly released when possible for, for explicit reason of allowing our 
foreign partners to 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 use it not only the the partners but their industry right in order to to be able to 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 compete it within their industry the the standards truly have to be open uh the we have been coordinating uh, uh government to government in terms of standards development but it, it would be nice at some point to have a a a, a better forum where they could more interactively participate in the sausage making, if you will, right? I mean, as, as, as Dr. Lipkin said, it's, it's one thing to provide written feedback. It's another to, to actually have them in the room and participate in the discussion. And it's it, it's not easy, but that's something I think we should still work towards over. So, Jeremy, let, or, uh, Jerry, let me clarify, because FACE is distro A, but what I'm discussing is I want to be able to have international participation sitting in the room with the creation and the modification of the right. standard as a whole. Right. I think that's kind of where I was going with a lot of it too, was, is um, when's that going to happen? I think I need to wrap up. Sally's uh, wearing out my phone with the text messages telling me to wrap. <laughs> um, I really appreciate uh, um, you guys uh, participating in the panel here today. Um, and so, I also... Um... Gary, one more item. Sorry to interrupt. So I've been scanning the Q and A's. Last year, um, Navy Tim, we did in Atlanta, demonstrated face OMS, Sea Coast, Mora, Red Hawk Toa, all working together in a Sosa CMOS uh, environment. And if somebody's interested, they can look up last year's TSOID to see how we got everybody to work together to give us a cool capability. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I think we're gonna to try to get answers to all these posted here um, when we wrap up here. So we'll, if we didn't get to your questions online, we will uh, we'll, we will definitely get an answer out to you. Um, and I, I appreciate the work you guys do. I know how hard it is to do the things you're doing. I've been involved in this industry for over 40 years myself, and I've seen great, great work uh, coming out the last few years, and you guys are definitely key contributors to that. So. With that, Sally, I'm going to turn it back over to you for the next uh, next session. Thank you. Very good. Gentlemen, all of you, thank you so very much. Uh, obviously, your contributions, not just in uh, your own uh, working groups, your own consortia and so forth, uh, a tremendous asset uh, to the government, to the industry, to academia, pulling all of this together, um, MOSA, MBSC, and, and so forth. So. Thank you. These ladies and gentlemen, these are our experts uh, and you will continue to see them uh, influence and uh, right at almost the, the front of the, the, the group, uh, making these things happen with FACE, SOSA, CMOS, HOST, uh, all just incredibly uh, uh, important uh, efforts. Uh, so again, thank you for participating. We will let you go at this point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, right now, we'd like to go ahead and bring you our next session. And next up, as you can see from our slide, uh, we're about to welcome Brendan O'Donnell and Jason York. They are going to, uh, of course, not just showcase the new FACE Business Guide Overview, key updates to know, as you can see here, but I believe that I caught a glimpse of Brendan and Jason's slides uh, last week. And I think they're going to go a little bit uh, more broad in their discussion. And the good news with that, of course, is that you will be able to get even more information about FACE. Again, our whole premise for this, Tim, is what's going on now, what's new, and where are things going, what's next? So with that, uh, Brendan, I see your face uh, on there. Uh, how's your mic check real quick? Can you hear me, Sally? I can hear you fine. And and Jason, are you, uh, Mr. York, are you with us as well? Yes, ma'am. Oh, perfect. All right. I will uh, go on mute and turn it over to you. Thank you again for joining us today for your session. It's all yours. Um, great. Thanks, Sally. Just wanted to say, uh, say thank you for having uh, Jason and I uh, present uh, this overview of the, of the latest version of the FACE Business Guide. Um, I think this is the probably the, the best resource produced from the FACE Consortium uh, for, for folks both inside and outside of the consortium to, to understand the value proposition of the, of the FACE approach, uh, both to government and to industry. So um, you'll be hearing from uh, two of us today, myself, um, I'm Brendan O'Donnell, I'm the Vice Chair of the 
face business working group. Uh, my background's in management consulting and, and flying helicopters. Um, I support uh, uh, Joe Carter and, and PEO Aviation. And then you'll also be hearing from uh, Jason York. Uh, Jason's background is in uh, software engineering and program management. Um, he's been really the principal driver behind the, the upgrades to the latest version of this uh, face business guide. And he also supports uh, P both PEO Aviation and uh, AVMAC, uh, the uh, Aviation and Missile Center in Huntsville. All right, so the agenda for today will cover uh, cover these topics. We'll, the title of this presentation is the Face Business Guide uh, Overview. So we'll talk a bit about upfront about the actual document itself, where you can find it. Um, and then we'll get into some of the uh, the contents of that that document that really do talk about um, the, the sort of the why behind the face approach and, and the uh, the um, key kind of goals and drivers and, and what we're trying to achieve from a from a business perspective. We'll talk um, about a bunch of misconceptions about face. So so a lot of times we hear face either is this or does that or or isn't this or doesn't do that. So uh, we'll we'll walk through some of the, the common misconceptions and, and all of this you can find in the actual uh, document, the face business guide. We'll talk uh, a bit about how fa the face approach uh, supports um, implementing uh, principles for MOSA. And then we'll get into some specifics on uh, the value proposition for the face approach to both government and industry. And then hopefully at the end, we'll leave a few minutes for some discussion. Okay, uh, this is actually the third version of the business guide that we have released. So as Brendan was mentioning, it is a very effective marketing tool with the primary audience, audience being executives uh, on the government side and industry to better understand the value that FACE brings. And, uh, you know, in this, uh, you know, Brendan's going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, uh, the FACE approach. Uh, what I know, you have heard that a lot. Uh, we tried to visually show and describe uh, what that actually means. Uh, we're going to talk about the value uh, specifically for the government uh, and industry, and then we're going to talk about applicability. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, this is great. It's a, it, it's a you know standard, so we can design it in, and that that is perfect uh, for future platforms." But there's also applic applicability to enduring platforms and some techniques to use uh, to make that happen. Uh, we're gonna briefly talk about rights and technical data and computer software. And uh, you know, this, it's uh, really no secret here. Uh, we do not need unlimited uh, you know, data rights. We need to be very selective in, uh, in what we ask for primarily uh, in the interfaces where we won't be locked in and we can promote uh, competition. Uh, this guide is available at the open group library and uh, there's a link uh, all you all you need to access it is a uh, open group login which is uh, you know freely available uh, to get okay uh, some major uh, enhancements from the previous version uh, we did a little bit better job describing succinctly what uh, encompasses the face approach uh, we'd mentioned in the previous version the common misconceptions, uh, but, but we provided a lot more detail on those, and we're going to talk about those at length today. And then with the uh, recent guidance that we've seen come down from, you know, DOD, Tri-Services, down through, um, you know, the, the organizations, the specific services, a lot of service-specific guidance on MOSA. And then, uh, you know, we are happy to report and, and Joe's actually already mentioned this in uh, his introductory slides in, in the previous session that the face approach addresses all five principles of MOSA. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but we have, you know, a couple things to add uh, business related uh, on that particular slide. Okay, so so as as I mentioned a bit earlier, the uh, the business guide is is really a great place if if you're unfamiliar with with what face is and what the face approach is trying to accomplish. It's it's a great resource for you to go uh, to go read through, but um, um, to under to really understand the the why 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 we're uh, pursuing this face approach. So so what is what is face uh, and the face approach? Well, the face approach defines um, an open avionics standard for software. Um, that has been collaboratively developed by uh, government, industry, and academia uh, partners. 
Um, it defines both technical and, and uh, business approaches for developing and procuring um, software for, for aviation systems. Um, it, uh, the work of the consortium is um, managed by and falls within the, the sort of the, the rules and processes for developing open standards uh, managed by the open group. Um, and, the, and as the, the speakers during the last presentation were, were mentioning, um, all of the completed uh, documents that have been uh, developed by the consortium are, are publicly available. They're, they're published uh, via the open group and, and anybody can go into that uh, open group library and, and download any of the completed uh, face technical or business uh, documents. But the bottom line for the face approach is that we're trying to get the best avionics aviation software uh, to the warfighter as fast as possible. Again, a lot of the, the similar uh, concerns that you've heard already from, from uh, some of the, the previous speakers. And so how do we, how do we get here? Um, historically, the, the, um, the DOD aviation systems uh, have been developed uh, to a unique set of requirements and they've been developed by, by a single vendor. Um, the face approach is really a response to some of these um, uh, historical issues in, in being able to uh, develop uh, software that can be reused uh, across platforms. Um, historically, it's been, been difficult to, to these, um, these unique requirements and these single vendors have made it very difficult to reuse software across platforms uh, as a result in, in increasing costs to uh, field the latest uh, software. Uh, there's high barriers to entry for, for uh, new technologies, and there's high barriers to uh, competition uh, both within and, and across platforms. And the result of this is that there's long lead times uh, to field the latest technology to the warfighter, even, even for very urgent needs. And it's due to the, the complexity and, and um, uh, to integrate those technologies onto the platforms. Um, up to this point, uh, DOD's acquisition structure really hasn't supported the use of uh, software or hasn't supported software reuse across platforms. So there, there's been a lack of commonly accepted uh, open standards. Uh, for those standards that, that have been developed, there was a lack of enforcement uh, to those standards. And the structure for many of the acquisition uh, program management activities um, has not uh, incentivized them or funded them to field uh, software that can be reused uh, across multiple platforms. And if you look at the chart there in the, the lower right-hand corner, uh, what you see is that this problem is not uh, unique to the DOD uh, community and, and commercial aviation saw similar um, increases in software complexity over time. So, um, and as more capabilities for aviation platforms have been uh, implemented in software, there was an exponential increase in, in the cost of integrating those capabilities onto platforms. Uh, commercial industry um, uh, developed some approaches to reduce that um, software integration around open standards um, and, and found some success. And the, the, the FACE approach is really um, an, an attempt to, be, to bring some of those approaches uh, to, to the uh, DOD aviation community. So as, uh, as Ilya uh, briefed in the, in the, the, the last uh, session, you know, uh, like so said, the, the, the key goal for FACE is to improve the affordability of capabilities. And, and, and that really means um, uh, reducing the cost for integration and, and, and enabling the Department of Defense to spend its investment dollars on capabilities. And then reducing the time it takes to field those uh, sort of latest and greatest technologies to the warfighter. Um, you see on the right there, uh, for, for an aviation platform, uh, it's going to have a systems architecture that looks at things like sensors, hardware, networks, uh, RF and signal processing. And, and the scope of the FACE approach is, is really uh, looks at um, software and software reuse across uh, platforms uh, for aviation systems. Um, a couple of the key kind of concepts behind FACE is to, is to be able to develop both technical and business processes 
to um, uh, support procurement and incentivize industry to develop software um, to the face uh, to to an open standard, um, and and provide some uh, support from both a technical development and and business um, um, from the business side to enable uh, a successful ecosystem to flourish for those uh, reusable software components, and then face is a is a um, component based software standard, meaning um, the, the, the things that get certified to the face technical standard are software components uh, rather than, let's say, whole systems or, or platforms. So it, it, it promotes some uh, measure of flexibility in, in um, as you're looking at what you're going to make open on, on a particular uh, system or platform uh, that, that faces is really looking at those um, software components for compliance to the face technical standard. So some key um, so some key attributes of the, of the, the face approach include the ability to support innovation, uh, enable more efficient technology insertion, as I mentioned uh, previously, previously enable uh, software uh, modularity in order to uh, port and reuse software across platforms. Um, early on, we looked at enabling a, a marketplace where users uh, and software developers, software integrators, government program managers could find uh, uh, products, applications that have been uh, developed to the FACE standard. And then um, FACE has taken the approach to, to, to align itself, uh, again, as has been mentioned in a couple of previous speakers, with other open architecture initiatives uh, and, and to the extent possible use existing industry standards within uh, the FACE approach. So from a business perspective, there's uh, um, several um, products and tools that are out there to support uh, dis uh, discovery and development of uh, face applications. Those include the um, a, a, a functioning up and running conformance program. So um, folks can take their software through uh, a series of testing and, and, and verification to ensure that the software has been built and, and uh, meets the technical requirements of the, the face standard. The face registry exists to, to enable uh, discovery of existing applications. And then uh, we've produced a sort of a host of uh, other things that are available for folks uh, tools, um, uh, templates uh, to support things like uh, how do I write an RFP for a uh, face um, application or how do I respond to uh, to one if I'm, uh, if I'm in industry. Um, for a long time, for those of us that have been around face for a while, uh, the work of the consortium was very future looking. So uh, we spent a lot of time um, sort of internally focused trying to uh, figure out what does it mean to uh, to be conformant to the face technical standard? What is the best way to verify that conformance? What's the best way to communicate um, sort of to the outside world about the availability of face components? But face is and has been for for a few years now uh, up and running. So we have a, um, a completely functional um, conformance process where a software developer can take their product, build it get it uh, verified uh, that it that it meets the face technical standard and then um, make that product available for folks who are interested in discovering uh, reusable software products. There's, as I mentioned, there's a face registry which lists all of the current uh, or list products that have been developed to the face technical standard. Um, and, and I was pretty sure this would happen, but uh, I think either yesterday or this morning since we developed these slides, there's there's now a, another uh, unit of conformance and an additional supplier that uh, that have been in, in the registry. So I, I apologize for um, um, not including uh, everybody, but um, but another one snuck in there after we put our slides together. But the bottom line is the face approach is is a is up. It's running. It's available and it's in use now. So here are the common uh, misconceptions that we uh, we mentioned earlier. So uh, you know, the, the FACE consortium has been up and running a little bit over you know 10 years, and this uh, is a very successful uh, OSA you know initiative. And, and in the past, uh, there was very unsuccessful you know ones for various reasons, not having uh, you know business processes covered, not having a conformance program. I, I won't I won't go into great detail there. 
but with the open um, um, systems architecture, you know, initiatives, uh, there, there's a lot of skepticism and there was a lot of misconceptions uh, proliferated. So some uh, of our communication was to dispel these. So a few years ago, we decided we're going to start writing these down and kind of hit them off, uh, you know, at the past. So we talk about this at, at the 101s uh, where people, you know, uh, will, will can kind of understand. It helps kind of scope. Uh, it, it shows what, uh, you know, the face approach is, what it is not. Uh, so Brendan and I are actually going to step through each of these and uh, provide a little bit more information. So I'll, I'll let uh, Brendan take the first one. Okay, so the, the first one that, that we had listed there was that uh, all, all, all software on a platform must be conformant to the face standard. Common misconception, and, and, and uh, this is certainly not true. So for any um, a PM out there or a systems integrator that's looking to integrate face uh, onto a system or a platform, there's a business case that, that needs to, to be done to, to um, look at whether it makes sense for you to um, develop a, a piece of software that, that can be reused. Um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, what in face that we use the term units of conformance for for those software components that that um, that are uh, both uh, verified and then certified to be built to the face technical standard, um, and um, uh, a system can be made up of um, uh, units of conformance of software applications that all have been uh, certified to the face te technical standard, or or some that have and some that haven't, uh, or or perhaps in a, in a larger system you may have some subsystems that have. No face components on them, but um, so so there's no there's no requirement for face uh, to you know for your system or your platform to have all face conformant software. Uh, it, it really is up to the PMs to do that to to develop that business case for um, um, whether to to integrate a uh, piece of software that's built to the face standard. Um, so so the bottom line here is. Uh, FACE does not certify systems or subsystems or, or platforms. Um, it, FACE certifies units of conformance, and it's up to uh, integrators and system developers to, uh, to identify which of those components will be and which won't be uh, built to the, to, to the FACE standard. Right. Here's one that we heard, uh, especially early on. Uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, existing, you know, program manager says, hey, this doesn't apply to me. This is just for future systems. Uh, the, the face approach uh, applies to both. If you are a fresh start, which we have a couple uh, on the Army side in the, uh, that, that we've been recently working on, uh, you can design in uh, the face infrastructure and the computing environment from the very beginning where you can take advantage of uh, use and reuse of face units of conformance. Uh, with the enduring fleet, you can attack this incrementally. Uh, you don't have to have, uh, you know, an upgrade focused strictly on incorporating face into your uh, platform. You can do this by setting up either full or partial face infrastructures. This can be you know, if you've got a, a new aircraft survivability equipment and you've got a little bit of uh, excess resources, you can you can set up a face infrastructure there with the ability to host UOCs. Uh, maybe, maybe you're, you know, upgrading a mission processor. That that would be, uh, you know, good. Um, another thing, if you could have a adjunct mission processor where you have a face infrastructure, uh, anytime that you have resourcing, uh, extra resource capabilities, where you can incorporate a partial infrastructure. And when I say a partial infrastructure, a lot of these UOCs don't have dependencies on all five of the um, uh, of the segments. So you may have a PCS component that really only needs uh, you know the, the the transport and then the operating system. So you, you can kind of look at this in a case by case basis, and you can incrementally you know grow to it. Uh, a few years ago, there was, uh, you know, a few of us um, uh, at, at, at Joe Carter's direction, uh, we looked at different integration patterns and how you could go about setting up these partial that would be able to grow to full, you know, face infrastructures. And the benefit, if 
obviously if you if you bake it in to the fresh starch, it's going to be there from the beginning. And if the enduring fleet has those infrastructures established, you can share uh, resources, you can share develop capabilities, and it really helps the enduring fleet address obsolescence issues. And a lot of things that was previously solved uh, with a hardware with a box can now be addressed uh, as a software implemented capability, and that could be on one of those extra resources that you have. That saves, you know, weight, that saves uh, maintenance in the future. And, and what we're really trying to do is provide more capabilities uh, with cost avoidance where we can extend our money uh, further. And, and having the, uh, the legacy platforms, enduring fleet, uh, play with the uh, future fleet really helps uh, you know, extend that um, uh, limited funding that we, we've experienced over the last several years. Good. Another another common uh, face misconception is that uh, face either somehow uh, guarantees or inhibits the functionality of my, the software that I'm developing. So, uh, you know, this is not a technical discussion, but at its core, face um, um, looks to um, verify that the software interfaces that have been developed to the face technical standard. And so your uh, your software application that you're developing um, can complete the face uh, verification process that does the technical look at your software and um, um, verifies that it was built um, in accordance with the face technical standard. Um, but when you actually, you know, run your um, your 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 software that adds uh, two plus two, uh, face is not going to not going to do anything in in its um, uh, when as it as it looks to to. There's nothing in the face conformance process that's going to, to guarantee that your uh, software, uh, when it adds two plus two equals uh, four. Um, so it, it, it can be, uh, it doesn't relieve the PM or the systems integrator of doing those uh, software uh, systems engineering processes to ensure uh, functionality and performance. Um, and so, um, so face is not going to ensure your, uh, your, your software um, performs its capabilities, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, there's nothing in face that that inherently is going to uh, inhibit it from um, from um, from doing its mission. Uh, the. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is um, uh, things like uh, airworthiness, uh, while there's a lot of uh, overlap and benefit from developing your software to the face technical standard and there's folks within the consortium that are specifically looking at something like that to um, to look at how we can uh, use artifacts developed for the face standard to support something like airworthiness uh, face itself is not going to either uh, uh, guarantee or inhibit um, a technical aspect like uh, airworthiness certification all right we, we've heard this a lot you know uh, Face, just the nature of it, requires unlimited data rights. This is absolutely not true. Uh, there's really no difference uh, with um, acquiring face um, or acquiring uh, software that addresses face requirements, software being you know face conformant, and any other software acquisition. So what we what we want to focus on is going after the data rights that we need and typically those are around the interfaces we want to use open interfaces so the face approach itself does not require any specific data right strategy and and the fact is the government can't afford uh, all the data rights from industry and if we could afford them we probably wouldn't know how to to use it and to modify that that's why we rely on industry because they're the experts so what we're trying to do with the, 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 the data right strategy is really focus on open interfaces where we're not locked into a particular vendor where we can open up, you know, competition. And um, there, there's benefits, you know, across the board, you know, for that. We want to promote innovation by increasing competition. And when we do that, you know, if you're a software supplier, you have to be encouraged by that because we just opened up the market for you. Uh, and instead of having to go directly, you know, with uh, one of these uh, 
you know, legacy enduring fleet, you know, prime contractors and, and going that way individually to get on, you can actually develop, you know, a software capability. And if it's the best of breed, we want to take it and we want to put it uh, across the platforms. You can keep all your intellectual property on that. All we're really asking for and we're pushing for is we're not stuck, you know, with that. We can replace it if, an, if another one uh, comes up. And, and we do that, you know, with uh, requiring open interfaces built off uh, open consensus-based standards. Um, quickly on, on another uh, misconception is, is that face is somehow cost or schedule prohibitive. I think Tyler in, in the in the brief right before ours uh, mentioned the fact that 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 uh, several years ago I think there was a lot more concern about uh, face and uh, building uh, a piece of software or a system uh, with face components. Um, but over time, I think folks have demonstrated that um, there's nothing specifically about face that um, um, would um, would would be cost or schedule uh, prohibitive in the development of a, of a piece of aviation software. Uh, and in fact, there's there's uh, a number of benefits to support things like um, um, uh, platform, um, software platform lines and, and uh, common reuse, um, um, even with, within organizations um, that, uh, that, the, that the face approach actually um, has benefits uh, that to, uh, to if, if not, improve your your uh, uh, ability to deliver within cost and on schedule um, doesn't appreciably uh, negatively impact it. Okay, uh, the, the last misconception we're going to talk about today is, uh, you know, the concept if uh, the FACE approach guarantees or prevents airworthiness qualification. That, that is not true. FACE does not uh, get you airworthiness qualification, nor does it prevent. Uh, what we what we found, and, and we've looked at this, a, a lot of times if a uh, capability enabled by software has been part of a system certification, they have, you know, established airworthiness, you know, documentation. What we found is they're able to reuse a lot of that documentation and take, you know, their CVM submittal and map to that. So it, it's it's not uh, they're they're definitely not mutually exclusive, uh, but but they don't uh, negatively impact you know each other, and uh, there was a um, a paper written uh, several years ago. It was actually a 2014 uh, you know that came out of MRDEC at the time, DevCom AVMIC, called a Developers Requirements Guide for Airworthy Reusable Face UOCs. That's actually publicly available. Uh, if anybody would like a copy of that, if you would just uh, drop me an email or let Sally know, she can pass it on to me. I'd be happy to provide you a copy of that. Uh, I will let you know there has been another paper uh, written uh, focused on integrators and, uh, you know, their guide for integrating airworthy reusable face, you know, UOCs. Unfortunately, that has not been uh, Distro A publicly released yet. Um, but um, if, if you have the right credentials, I can definitely put you in contact with the uh, author if, if you're interested and if he can, you know, release it, uh, you know, to you. He'd be happy to do that with a contingency that you review it and give comments back uh, to, to improve that paper. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about value to the government. And the, these are kind of the things that's important. Uh, you know, to the government, we kind of think of them as, as big blocks. Um, you know, they, they overlap, you know, some. Obviously, you got policies and mandates, affordability, time to field, uh, you know, capabilities, and then reuse to extend the money. Um, I don't have a slide on the NDAAs, but what we've seen, you know, with the NDAAs, specifically in uh, FY17, there was a big push for MOSA uh, in major weapon systems. And they actually called out major system interfaces. So they, it, was, it was almost like they were focused on, you know, making sure that they were open where we would have interoperability between systems. Uh, this year in 21, when the NDAA came out, they took that down a level and uh, they, they added modular system interfaces and were very interested in going after uh, the software rights, you know, for those. Um, the DOD has plans that haven't been formalized yet, but it was mentioned in the NDAA to have interface repositories where they can be, 
you know, tested out and 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 demonstrated, uh, you know, to to prove, you know, that they're open and can be, you know, reusable. And then the next slide um, is, is going to talk a little bit more about MOSA. <clears throat> when we talk, oh, uh, not ready, not quite ready yet. So uh, affordability, you know, we we've heard it a lot. We have to do more with less. And the way we do that, we promote competition. We have to. Uh, reuse across platforms. We can't provide, we can't purchase these capabilities from scratch for every platform. We have to, as Joe mentioned in his charts, we have to extend our money. So program A has to get maybe the first two capabilities and program B supplements that to get the third and program uh, C supplements that to get the fourth. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Lipkin, you know, really pointed out a high priority for the government is to get these capabilities to the field faster. And we're trying to reduce integration time. And uh, if anybody's been in a technical briefing, uh, you understand that the restrictions are really on the software developer to benefit the integrator. So that's really what we're you know, focused, on, focused on. As far as capabilities go, we want to get new and enhanced capabilities uh, to our warfighters to maintain our battlefield uh, superiority. Uh, I understand that's kind of a, you know, military view. You can also, you know, expand that. We we want to provide it to the uh, commercial aircraft. You, you know, also these capabilities uh, would be used across, you know, DoD and commercial. And then we'd already mentioned it, uh, you know, the reuse and how important, you know, that is with limited funding. Uh, to be able to provide these capabilities uh, across the aircraft. Aircraft. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit more about MOSA, uh, a little bit more detail. So we were very encouraged two years ago. Tri Services memo came out, and it was actually a a, a question uh, around lunchtime, and uh, I was I was I was excited about that. It's good to get that information out. So the uh, secretaries of all the service, all three services put out MOSA for our weapon system is a warfighting imperative. And they actually cited uh, several uh, open standards, FACE, SOSA, VICTORY. And they talked about how important it is that this, that we continue developing these standards and vital for our success. And follow on to that, each of the services has really taken that and ran with it. So the Navy came out with uh, guidance very shortly after that, a couple months after that. Uh, the Army Acquisition Executive, and then I'm I'm more familiar, you know, with that, and then what followed after that uh, came and and issued, you know, guidance on implementing, you know, MOSA, and then the Air Force also uh, last summer uh, had more guidance on implementing MOSA. Pull that thread a little bit. Uh, I've got a lot of visibility in, in what's happened on the Army side. So the AAE memo, they actually empowered ASALT, Office of the Chief System Engineer, to, to direct MOSA into PEOs and into um, uh, PMs. And uh, that guidance actually came out uh, last summer, uh, June 10th. And then M Joe mentioned the MOSA transformation effort that we're undergoing at PEO Aviation. We are aligned with that guidance. And... Um, uh, PEO Aviation to to address that. It is aligned with the five MOSA principles, and uh, wh which is you know really good you know for the face approach because we baked that in from the beginning. So that is a open standard that really supports uh, all these MOSA MOSA uh, initiatives and the guidance that we we see coming out. Next slide. So Joe's already briefed a uh, version of this slide. Uh, the big takeaway uh, face approach addresses all five MOSA principles. And I, and I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. Um, in the establishing you know, environment, uh, there is training available. There's more training you know, on the way. And then we also have tailable contract language. Uh, you know, Brendan and I support the uh, business working group, another piece that we have is uh, the, the FACE contract guide, and that actually has recommended language that we, uh, you know, have to put to include FACE requirements in solicitations. So I think Joe did a good job covering that, so I won't spend any more time on this chart. Okay, um, just real quick, you know, Jason talked a bit about the, the, the value of proposition for, for uh, 
for the government uh, participants in, in the face consortium. Certainly, uh, you can you can just look at the uh, the member list of the consortium and, and see that industry sees value also in the face approach. So so not only uh, will they be able to support the government's requirements for for things like MOSA requirements and, and face specific requirements on on contract. Um, but there's also an opportunity in industry to increase uh, competitive opportunities. Uh, if you have the latest and greatest uh, technology uh, with face, you in the future uh, may have a, a better chance of getting that fielded on a platform than you would under uh, the, the uh, legacy approach for for developing uh, aviation software. And uh, bottom line is is uh, companies are seeing a, a, an ability to improve shareholder or stakeholder value. Uh, from from following the face approach. Uh, face, as ha has been mentioned, um, the intent there is not to, to limit it to the future fleet, but uh, the approach uh, supports uh, fielding uh, face applications on both the uh, enduring fleet and the future fleet. Um, so for the future fleet, obviously all of these things we've talked about uh, are, are being designed in um, um, things like enabling uh, more rapid technology insertion uh, to be able to um, uh, increase the uh, pace at which we uh, field capabilities and reducing the, the cost and complexity. And the bottom line is as, as we look forward over the next uh, decades to be able to you know, keep pace with our adversaries by, by fielding um, in a cost efficient way the most um, uh, current uh, capabilities for the warfighter. So applicability to enduring fleet, we've uh, we've pretty much covered this in the in the misconceptions, but there's a distinct benefit uh, of the enduring fleet of establishing a full or partial face infrastructure where we can uh, utilize uh, you know these face UFC that's already been developed or develop their own where they can you know be pushed forward to the other platforms. also kind of covered this too um you know data rights the, the government and industry are trying to uh you know establish a great relationship for the government we don't really need your ip we want open interfaces we're not locked in a specific vendor and the government's really opening up the market for these software suppliers uh to play in areas that they haven't been able to uh, to play with before so it's it's really a win-win for the government and industry All right, so uh, Sally, I think we're coming in uh, right on schedule here, but um, we just wanted to say thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, the the face business guide is is um, is publicly available is uh, for folks that are interested in doing a deeper dive into uh, the why behind face the 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 value of face to both government and, and industry participants of the consortium. Um, that's a great place to start to. Um, to get a better understanding of, of, uh, of the face approach. So if anybody's got any questions, certainly uh, feel free to reach out to, to me or to Jason um, or um, you know, any of the other uh, leadership of the, of the face consortium. So again, thank you for your time and uh, we'll stand by for, for any questions. Right. Well, and as you said, Brendan and Jason both, thank you so much. Clearly you have a tremendous amount of um, material that you shared here today. The really good news is this is all going to get posted on, again, the open group websites, both FACE and SOSA, as well as the Expo Tim 2021. Um, that way it can be easily accessed and shared with everybody. We are low on time. We do want to move over uh, to our um, also another cool session that we have coming from our SOSA team. Um, so any incoming questions, uh, we'll funnel those over to you, uh, if not today, tomorrow, and let you reply back to folks accordingly. So thank you both for your time. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you for a whole lot of material that I know is going to be just well received and has been here already, but uh, I appreciate that. So I will bid you adieu uh, and welcome our next group. Thank you, Brendan, again, and Jason. Appreciate it. So as uh, you can tell, we are also very excited to be bringing you this session, uh, SOSA Business Executive Overview, Benefits and Adoption of this new standard. 
Today, we not only have our, our three co-presenters, Mike Orlovsky, Valerie Andrew, and Roy Keeler, I also happen to rope in on the phone uh, Patrick Collier. And for those of you that may or may not be familiar with Patrick, actually, I'm going to sneak a peek over here at my notes. Uh, Patrick is a senior open systems engineer at Aspen Consulting. He's also a, a SOSA member who has been heavily involved with the conformance piece. So if in fact, when Mike and Valerie and Roy uh, move through their presentation, if in fact we do have time at the very end for some questions and they refer to conformance, I may tap Patrick uh, to speak up. Um, again, hoping that we all have uh, good audio uh, going forward. Uh, also, when they do wrap up this session, I would like to ask you to stick around for another 60 seconds. We do have further contact information for you and some information about the September 14th open group face. Uh, I was going to say so, so forgive me. The open group face expo and Tim, which is now slated for September 14th in Huntsville. So just a quick save the date on that one. But in the meantime, Mike, I see you're online. I want to double check. Uh, how is your mic? Are you good oh, to go, sir? I believe I'm good to go. Can you hear me? Perfect. Valerie, and you're on with good audio, oh, ma'am. I am. Very good. And Mr. Keeler, Roy, are you on as well, sir? Yes, Sally, I am. Hot uh, dog. All right. Thanks. That's always good news. And Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you and go on mute. And to the three of you, please let us know what's up. Okay. Thank you, Sally. And uh, good good afternoon. Thank you for attending our uh, presentation today. I'm Mike Harlowski. I'm the SOSA Business Working Group Chair. And my co-presenters uh, are uh, Roy Keeler, uh, who's our Business Architecture Subcommittee Chair, and Valerie Andrew, who's our Outreach Chair. Uh, you'll hear from both Valerie and uh, Roy a little bit later. Uh, this past year has been uh, a challenge and both Roy and Valerie adapted their subcommittees to, to operate in this virtual mode and continue to deliver the, the results that you'll be seeing in the presentation. Uh, I also, or we wanna extend our thank you to our Tim host, Navair PMA 209, along with the coordination by by the open group. And I do have to call out a special thank you to, to Sally, uh, who worked closely with us to uh, essentially make this presentation uh, a reality. Bit of orientation, so SOSA is the Sensor Open System Architecture. Uh, we're a consortium uh, within the open group. And SOSA is focused on the sensor domains of radar, um, electronic or electro-optical uh, infrared, uh, electronic warfare and communication. So if we go to the next slide. Let's see, and Sally, I seem to be having trouble moving the slide you know, Mike, forward. Oh, right, there we and go. I think I we just, it. there we go. Just checking. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, uh, so in a nutshell, so, uh, Okay, so our collaborative approach, we address both the technical and business aspects uh, of the, the uh, four domains or five domains that, that we just mentioned. Uh, the technical aspects are focused on the set of rules for the, the reference architecture for uh, SOSA. And so those, are, those rules are organized in the SOSA technical standard. Uh, our current publicly uh, available document is uh, essentially the snapshot three document that can be found on the open group website uh, under the SOSA consortium. So you go there and it'll show you how to, to essentially register and uh, download the, the document. Uh, as you've heard uh, previously today, the version one technical standard uh, will be released uh, very soon. Uh, our presentation today, we're focused on the, the business aspects. And so the, the business, aspects essentially uh, describe the, what I'd say is the collaborative ecosystem around the SOSA standard. So we have the technical aspects, but more or equally important, uh, we have the business aspects that essentially uh, describe how we balance the needs and constraints of the acquirer, uh, the supplier and the technologist and how they operate uh, with the standard. Uh, the, the standard also 
addresses the fact that uh, we're operating now in certainly an accelerating evolution of today's environment. So things are changing rapidly. So the, the standard has to, and the business ecosystem uh, has to be flexible enough to, to react to, to this. So if we go to, let me get the next slide. Let's see, I seem to have lost my uh, slide control. There we go. There we go. So advantages, disadvantages. So uh, the transition to digital engineering is underway, as was mentioned uh, earlier. The SOSA reference architecture supports this uh, transition. So you can look through and uh, we call out a number of benefits and advantages. But we employ essentially a standardized composition and set of interfaces to essentially facilitate the commonality reuse and technology insertion uh, into the, the sensor systems. We recognize that full life cycle, so the design development, integration, and support. And you can see from both the government perspective and the, the industry perspective uh, that this approach has a variety of, of uh, benefits to both the, the acquirer, the supplier, uh, and the, the technologist. So from the uh, acquirer perspective, uh, tech insertion that, that will occur as new capabilities uh, come out, uh, as other capabilities become uh, obsolete. Um, from a vendor uh, or industry perspective, the modular decomposition helps us uh, structure uh, what we're providing. The interfaces are known and tested. Uh, and then we have the standard space tooling to, to support this. So SOSA really ad addresses that, that whole uh, business ecosystem regard uh, surrounding the, the standard to, to make it successful. So if we go to, let me to the next slide. So we built on a set of uh, existing standards. And so Ilya mentioned uh, earlier that we're leveraging this very large body of st open standards that, that are out there. And these standards are both government-based and industry-based uh, standards. So we've talked about FACE in the previous presentation. You've heard about CMOS and HOST uh, earlier, but we also leverage many other uh, standards. So the VITA standards, SA SAE, uh, standards. And this diagram attempts to uh, sort of organize that large body of standards that, that we're uh, applying. And so again, I'd refer you to snapshot three to see that significant uh, body of work that's been accomplished to date. Uh, there's contact information on the, the website. And then at the end of this presentation, as you look at this and you have questions, uh, you can also reach out to us. And the team uh, right now is certainly working in overdrive to publish uh, technical standard uh, 1.0 uh, this year. And let me go to... So uh, consortium membership. So. Uh, I think we mentioned uh, around 100 uh, members. So we have nine uh, sponsor level members of, uh, of SOSA. We have 13 principal members and 89 uh, associate members. And uh, as the word of SOSA continues to, to, to get out there, uh, we are continuing to, to grow. Uh, we encourage folks to uh, join and uh, be uh, or participate in the standard. The, uh, technical standard and the business products, you'll hear a little bit later, these are all developed from essentially the consortium uh, membership. So the, the membership essentially provides both technical um, and uh, business subject matter experts uh, to participate uh, within the working groups and subcommittees uh, to develop the, the products that, that you'll be seeing. Uh, the whole consortium, uh, meets nominally uh, five to six times per year. Uh, normally, uh, in normal times, it was in person uh, in various spots uh, throughout uh, the continental uh, US. Uh, but this year we've adapted and uh, we've been uh, meeting in a virtual format. And I 
uh, we'll do a, a shout out. Thank you to Sharon and the open group uh, because they invest a significant coordination amount of coordination time to enable a successful and, and organized uh, meeting. But uh, we do uh, have a large body of members to, to draw from and encourage folks to uh, join and uh, help us continue to evolve the products. Our social organization uh, is set up uh, around essentially an advisory board steering committee. We have two working groups and two standing committees. Uh, the uh, technical working group is responsible for the, the technical standard. Uh, business group is essentially the business uh, processes and value proposition. Uh, as I was uh, reviewing these slides earlier today, I realized we did uh, have one typo slip through. Uh, Roy Keeler is actually our business architecture uh, subcommittee uh, lead. And as you heard earlier, Patrick um, is our uh, conformance uh, lead. So the um, conformance uh, standing committee is focused on essentially the conformance program to uh, essentially uh, govern the use of conformant to the to SOSA technical standard. Uh, our architecture standing committee addresses the conceptual and logical integrity of the, the re reference architecture. And uh, essentially, the, uh, the advisory board is sort of those senior experts that uh, advise the steering committee uh, on that sort of the, the bigger picture as to uh, the, uh, how the standard uh, fits within the larger uh, domain. Now, uh, Val, or Roy and Valerie will uh, address the essentially business architecture conformance and significant body of resources and outreach that's occurring. And so uh, Roy is with Adling Technologies. He's our business architecture subcommittee lead. And I'll now turn it over to Roy to, to continue on. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. So um, as Michael was saying, uh, we are responsible for developing uh, navigation guides for the SOSA consortium to do with business acquisition and suppliers. And there are several pieces of that. One is the business guide, and um, that is uh, in draft form now. We're very, very close to uh, getting that completed. The conformance program, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move through the presentation. Conformance program is well in, under its way, as you can imagine, uh, with all the different stakeholders within the organization. Conformance is a, is a, big, uh, a big lift for everybody. It takes a lot of coordination among all the various uh, standing committees. Then we have the SOSA registry. We'll talk a little bit about the registry, how it fits into the whole scheme of the acquisition guide. And then, um, of course, the acquisition guide in itself and how products um, can be procured and how they can be specified that meet the SOSA technical standard. And then um, Valerie will, will talk about the marketing guidelines and how that pertains to the overall business guide. So uh, what is the business guide? Well, it, it shows you uh, what our SOSA value proposition is. You've heard uh, throughout all today's presentations and, and even with uh, Admiral Peter's uh, opening comments of the value that FACE brings to the uh, community. Well, we are doing the same thing with SOSA. We're bringing value not only to the government, but also hopefully to the industries that support um, uh, the SOSA standard and are implementing uh, SOSA, com SOSA compliant uh, products. Um, so within all of these uh, guides and um, models that we are providing, uh, as I mentioned, we have the business guide, the acquisition guide, this hooks into the technical standard, and then we have also the conformance policy that ties all of that together. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the conformance program. So um, the conformance program provides all of these things that you see here, and as you can imagine, it's um, uh, 
pretty uh, complex uh, process uh, for conformance. Um, one of the things about conformance is it's not uh, going to be implemented all in one shot. Conformance is a conformance is going to be uh, phased in, and that's going to depend on the maturity of the technical standard. As more things become uh, implemented in the technical standard, the conformance uh, um, program will expand with that. Now, we don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, we don't know in what uh, what the sequence will be, and I, as I said, it will be guided by the technical standard. Um, so we're also taking into account what types of products that our suppliers will be building to go into through conformance. So uh, we're now soliciting information from the supplier community and from the user community to know where they want to go with, uh, with their products so we can then tailor the conformance policy to meet those uh, product demands. Um, we're also working on developing uh, the test tools because we do need an extensive set of test tools for the conformance program. And we're actively engaged um, with industry to let us know what they will be developing for conformance. Another part of that is the uh, verification authorities. So um, we, we've put together the verification matrix guide, and now we're, we're vetting and we're talking to organizations to be verification authorities for SOSA compliant or SOSA aligned uh, hardware. Uh, this process can be many different ent entities. It could be a, uh, a lab, it can be a, uh, a, a command, or it can be a private uh, supplier of, a, of systems. So we're working out all of the different um, formats for informants. So at, at a very high level, um, we have SOSA verification authorities they uh, comply to or submit their uh, products to the um, uh, verification authority. Uh, they either get a pass or fail, whether they're SOSA compliant or not. If, they're, if they pass, they're certified, and then they're put into the uh, SOSA registered for a SOSA certified product. So um, these certified products will be, uh, are actually called uh, procurable units, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the, uh, in the presentation. But this is kind of an overview of how the certification process is designed to work. So um, what does the, Let's move on to the acquisition guide here a little bit. What does the acquisition guide provide for you? Well, um, it addresses things, as we mentioned, conformance. It addresses things like technical data rights uh, on both sides, on the procurement side and on the supplier side. Um, we also give examples on how to write a statement of work, uh, where that's going to impact the supplier and how the, its response how you respond to uh, those questions or those requirements coming out of the procurement agencies. And it also provides some evaluations for awards. So um, the procurement managers can now look at these uh, uh, responses that come in and then evaluate those um, responses as how they fit into the um, SOSA standard. And again, you're going to hear this throughout the presentation and throughout SOSA, uh, the, the benefits that SOSA brings. We're really trying to knock down the time to market so we can get new and exciting products out into the, out into the warfighter and out into the field. We want to bring down the cost for both the suppliers and the procurers. And we want compatibility. We, we want to, we want to, eliminate as much as we can vendor lock on certain systems or on systems and open up the competition. So these are all key points and all key benefits that we look at when we're writing and when we're developing uh, the SOSA acquisition guide. 
So what does the acquisition flow look like? Uh, well, this is the uh, operational reforce, or resource, pardon me, flow diagram uh, out of the DODAF. And when you look at this, you notice that um, right off, we're, it's um, rather open as far as definitions of who these various entities are. When you look at an acquirer, um, that's just an organization that's going to want to purchase a procurable unit that's conformant to the SOSA technical standard. And you might ask, what is a procurable unit? Well, procurable unit is a product that's defi is defined as a product that's been um, uh, comprised of uh, one or more certified SOSA uh, compliant um, sensor components. So um, the acquirer is the one going out and getting the procurable units. Now this could be a government entity, this could be another systems integrator. We left that uh, the definition of what an acquirer is wide open. Same thing with a supplier. This is an organization that's um, supplying sensors that are um, uh, aligned with the uh, SOSA technical standard. Uh, it can be uh, many different types of suppliers. It could be a board supplier. It could be a system level supplier. We don't define that as well. Then as we mentioned, the conformance program, there's, there's the verification authority and the certification for authority within the conformance program. Products are submitted to the conformance program. They are either um, passed as uh, conformant or not. And then uh, once they are and they have certification and verification results, those are put into the SOSA registry. Now, the, the SOSA registry is a catalog that's going, that is maintained by the open group that contains all of the information, all of the metadata that you would need to make a selection for a SOSA compliant or aligned product. We're trying to make this as um, transparent and as easy as we can for the user. One thing I will, um, I will mention uh, is there are resources that are going to have to be supplied by both the uh, acquirer and the supplier in this process. Um, a product is going to have to go through the conformance program. There is going to be uh, resource required uh, to be able to do that. And the same thing on the supplier program. You're going to have to look at providing budget for, or on the acquire, pardon me, on the acquire side, um, for these additional um, uh, standards that have to be uh, implemented. So uh, there, there is um, some cost associated with this um, and uh, as far as uh, maintenance is concerned as well. And uh, th that is the um, overall view of the uh, SOSA acquisition guide. Uh, we should be putting this out. Uh, we're in draft form now. Uh, we're making very good progress, as Michael indicated. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, let me know. And I believe that's my last slide. With that, I'll tur turn it over to Valerie Andrew. Valerie? Thank you, Roy. So my role, as uh, Roy and Mike mentioned, is as the chair of the outreach. I have a co-chair. Uh, Gina Peter, who is with Pentec, um, and I wouldn't be able to accomplish as much as we do without her. So uh, we also have a very active team of people who help out. Um, so Roy's side handles the business and acquisition uh, collateral resource assets, and our team handles the outreach uh, and marketing uh, promotional anything to do with uh, getting the word out, basically. Next slide, please. So as you've probably already seen, we do have a website. We have uh, lots of good plans for it. Uh, this coming year, we plan to update it and improve it uh, 
face has set the uh, stage for us and um, they're getting ready to improve their website and and uh, release it into the wild and we're going to leverage the work that they did uh, to make the, our similar kind of improvements. We have uh, we started a newsletter this year actually we're getting we're collecting materials to do the second one if you want to sign up for it uh you can go to the website and and uh, put your name in uh we include member news releases articles uh links to webinars um trade shows when they come back on board and um and a variety of different resources both technical and and business related the uh, to that end, um, there are there's there's quite a quite a lot of activity going on. Uh, we also do collateral and, and uh, show kits, as we refer to them. Again, once face to face kicks back in, you'll see some of those. We provide member placards for all of the members that are attending uh, designated events. Uh, we do news conferences where it makes sense. We bring in experts either tied directly to the show audience or to our membership to help get the word out um the as Ilya mentioned before there are plug fests um that's more driven by uh, the technical team uh, but we do try to help get the word out uh, via trade shows we have uh the tso oaid which occurred in january we had attempted to have one uh on two or three different occasions last year and that didn't happen uh, so hopefully that'll pick up this year as well we also contribute speakers to webinars and uh, symposium events uh, we've done some recently and there are quite a few member driven webinars we as a matter of fact just did one on conformance with the help of patrick collier that uh, sally mentioned and the um, manager of conformance uh, at the open group, Sue Harper. The, we are also gonna be having uh, a webinar in April that will talk to the, the differences and similarities and how the variety of different standards that have been talked about today uh, work together and how they, how they uh, fit together. So other assets we have is YouTube tutorials. The, we're just getting started on that. We do have a LinkedIn page. You're free to follow us. We try to keep up with uh, news plugs on there. Uh, we're also launching a Wikipedia page. Um, the thing I, I skipped over on the previous slide was the marketing guidelines, and Mike touched on that. Uh, what we include in there are things like how the proper usage of the SOSA logo and the trademark, um, how to uh, incorporate it into your marketing materials. Uh, we also provide guidelines uh, to, um, to different kinds of opportunities. We have had the media reach out to us and offer special discounts to the members. Uh, so all of that is included with the marketing guidelines. Next slide, please. These are just a couple examples of assets. One of them was actually the infographic that Mike showed earlier. It uh, hasn't passed its final uh, call for consensus within the committee, which happens at the, at the BWG level, uh, but that came out of the outreach committee. The, we have a trifold that's a membership piece that can be handed out. Uh, you can see a, a sample of it on the left. And there's an executive overview of the what the what SOSA is. It's a very top level, I don't know, I think it's about 15 slides uh, that talks to SOSA for uh, for executives who are interested in finding out more about SOSA and why they need to pay more attention to it. Next slide, please. So again, it, it has been mentioned uh, earlier, we are forging forward with uh, version 1.0. There's still quite a bit of work being done within committees, uh, but the goal is to release it sometime this summer. Uh, the other goal that we have as uh, 
as we've also mentioned, we do have meetings that are roughly every every other month. They've gone virtual over the past year, and we hope to bring it back to face to face. And with any luck, we might be able to do it in August, uh, which is when my company is actually slated to to host. So we're very hopeful that that can that can happen in person. Next slide, please. So I, I invite any and all of you to join us if you would like to contribute to the business working group uh, at the top level. We meet once a week on Mondays and then uh, we have the two subcommittees outreach and conformance and we meet every other week on Tuesday afternoons um, sharing that time slot. So it's it's once twice a month roughly that they meet. And uh, on the next slide. You'll find our contact information. We encourage you to reach out to us, ask any questions that you have. If you want to join, if you have a great idea that you want to contribute, by all means, reach out to us. So thank you for your time. I am, uh, I've completed the, the, the roster. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Roy. I'm not uh, seeing a great deal of questions come in the window, um, but I will tell you that as you all three know, uh, and Patrick, who is joining us uh, uh, by phone kind of standing by, we have been inviting our attendees to send me questions, especially those that don't want to necessarily reveal who they might be on the open Q&A window. So just uh, be aware that I may be shooting some uh, questions over in your direction in the next day or so. Um, in the meantime, as uh, all of our guests can see, here are the contact information um, for the, the SOSA team here that just presented that session. Don't be shy, please feel free. These are very uh, involved folks uh, with SOSA. Uh, and and just have a, a plethora of information to share. So again, don't hesitate to reach out to Mike or Valerie or Roy. The Open Group SOSA Consortium, of course, uh, always an open door. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say goodbye. And before uh, to all of our guests, before we say goodbye to you, um, just wanted to show this slide very quickly. As mentioned earlier, all three websites, the opengroup.org face, and SOSA and ExpoTim2021.com will have these presentations up as well as the videos. Uh, and then again, there is my contact information below. Feel free, reach out to me at any time. And then our final slide before I bid you all goodbye, I wanted to again share with you to save the date for September 14th. This will be the open group FACE Consortia Technical Interchange Meeting and Expo. Uh, crossing our fingers, it will be live and in person. It should be. We certainly hope that's going to be the case uh, at the Von Braun Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And um, to that, I, I am excited to say PEO Aviation will be hosting that. Uh, Mr. Joe Carter, Ms. Alicia Taylor, uh, and uh, a whole vast team that uh, will be on board for that. Um, other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking your time, for staying with us, for enjoying it. Again, a great deal of information about the Open Group Face and Consortia and open standards, open architecture, and open innovation. I will bid you all a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you, Sally. My pleasure. Thank you all.